school, you know, just train, 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 blah, blah, blah. And then all of a sudden, um, Saddam decides to invade Kuwait. So um, we started prepping for that. I had no idea when we were going to go, but we knew we were going. So uh, jumped over there with the uh, armored unit, 367 armored commander was a guy named Doug Tystead. Um, they called him the Jolly Rancher commanders. Instead of giving out coins, if you did a good job, he'd give you a Jolly Rancher candy. <laughs> Dudes loved him. Um, we, uh, it was myself, Bill Dietz. I don't know if you know Bill. I don't think so. Um, he was at the, the, he was at the 82nd for a while. And I think he retired up in Alaska. Uh, but Bill was my airman, um, you know, just a freshly, you know, maybe a year or two experience as a JTAC. Um, that was a, uh, interesting nine months, um, for us. Uh, <laughs> we were out one day, there was a nighttime. We had AC-130 show up. They wanted to do some training over our TAA. The only person we told was Colonel Tystead. And this is, you know, they were using their big, um, they were putting the burn down. Yeah. And, uh, you know, we were in the center. It was just a, you know, a, a, a square formation, you know, with each of the companies out. And all of a sudden, you know, they're doing their wake up every 30 minutes doing a scan. And oh, the radio just explodes. <laughs> they're freaking out because it's like daylight outside all of a sudden, but it's pitch black. They have no idea what's going on. Well, we're just calling off targets within the formation and the Colonel, the Colonel Tysta is just rolling laughing. He goes, I'll have to tell him about it tomorrow, but I won't let him sit on edge for a while. So, uh, was yeah. it, so were they doing, uh, were they just checking your perimeter or what were they, did, did they, um, was this, no, we, it was a training, training up for them or. Yeah, they were just, they, you know, they were running dry runs out there. Uh, they would you know, we stayed in touch with where they were coming out of. And it's like, Hey man, we've got formation spread over here. If you guys want to come, it keeps us, you know, operating and all that because you sat there for quite a long period of time. I think we got there in October. No, maybe it was earlier than that, but we sat there until we kicked off, you know, until we moved up toward the border after the, you know, the air war started. So yeah, you had to do something to maintain. Um, they set up gunnery ranges. You know, we coordinated with the A-10s. We'd bring them in on the gunnery ranges. Uh, pretty impressive watching, you know, a company of tanks in line firing in volume maneuver. Um, saw that both in training and real life there. Um, yeah. So, I mean, our last battalion objective was the Avenue of Death. Um, we went through Ali Al Salim Airfield. Um, battalion lost one guy. He was our master gunner, a guy named uh, Whiskey, Harold Whiskey. Uh, he'd taken care of us. I mean, you know, we had a 113 track, had a brand new, and I'm not kidding you, this guy had been out of AIT six weeks when we deployed. Um, me and Bill used an antenna, you know, the top of an FM whip antenna with a ball on the top to communicate heavily when we needed to with this guy, because he liked to sightsee. And <laughs> the day we went through the breach, Alpha Company was on the right hand, uh, you know, the right of us. And one of their tanks hit an anti, hit a mount, hit a mine. I think it was an anti-tank, but it blew the ballistic skirt like 60 feet in the air. And this kid's, we're driving through the breach lane, and this kid's like eyeballing over his shoulder, and it's like whack him on top of the head with the antenna. You know, your eyes are forward. Sure. I'll tell you when you can look someplace else. Right. But um, we lost whiskey when we got up to the Avenue of Death. We were in a, we got a pretty good fight up there. Um, you know, the Iraqis had just, They'd been setting still for a long time because anytime they moved the aircraft with whack and when we rode up, they, you know, they opened up with everything they had around there. They were trying to turn a 2S1 to fire directly on us and the um, battalion commander's tank put a Sabo through it and it burned for 24 hours. Um, but Whiskey got hit uh, that day and couldn't get a meta back in. He bled out. Um, so, you know, it's, it's pretty significant when, you know, you've gone through that whole time period and you lose one guy out of the battalion. And the one guy you know 
or the one guy is somebody everybody in the battalion knows. Yeah. So, um, and then, you know, after it was over, we were up, you know, the battalion commander was, dude, he, we, we led with the lead company of the, 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 the battalion and his orders to me is, you know, you're never more than 25 meters off my right or left flank. Um, but we, before we got to right out, right before we got to Ali al Salim, there was, um, we got another fight and, um, you know, we started to form back up to move out. And in the middle of the formation was like the, uh, ADA guys, the, uh, fisters and all that. And I never forget Bill Dietz going, what the hell is that? And I turn around and I look. You know, I was looking off to our uh, right flank, and you could see a couple of BMPs and stuff. They looked whole, but they weren't. Mm. Well, the guys in the middle of the formation had song and started firing their 50 cows across the formation, and rounds were bouncing and hitting our track. Oh, my God. And Jeez. I remember watching Tysted's tank turn the turret. And, you, you know, if you've ever seen an M1 lock on a target, it, the, the muzzle bounces mm -hmm. i remember this call like it was yesterday renegade six this is hound six hound six this is renegade six over renegade six if you fire that weapon again without my permission you will cease to exist hound six out <laughs> the next oh call was he called our call he gave us a call sign of porcupine because of all the antennas on the track and he's yeah. like you know, hey, Porcupine 6, are you okay? Roger, sir, we're good. We had the only operational GPS. He's like, well, where the hell are we? Yeah, I'm giving <laughs> coordinates and all right, let's move. And it, dude, it was just, I mean, you think about it, the Army hadn't been in a fight other than Grenada and Panama with armor in how many years? Yeah, exactly. So. But I mean, there was the one other story there is we were, it was after the ceasefire, we were, we set road, road rock positions up around the entrance, you know, the big um, Cloverleaf interchange going into Kuwait City and we're checking people coming in and out. And we were up visiting, I think it was Alpha Company again, we were up visiting them and um, all of a sudden just all hell breaks loose, you know. 60s 50s you know coaxes on the tank are firing and there's this 18 wheeler that is blown through the roadblock and it finally stops and Dietz and i were pretty close so we ran up pulled the driver out put him in a you know in a, a hold down position and then um you know we start trying to figure out what it was well it was a kuwaiti family that had fled and they were trying to get back to their house in the back of the truck were two girls, probably three to five years old, and their grandfather. And out of all those rounds that went through that 18-wheeler, only the grandfather was hit. But, you know, I, at that amazing. point, I had a I had a little girl back home. Yeah. And, you know, that kind of was like, wow. The family was just trying to get back to their house in Kuwait City. Did the grandfather make it or did he, did he pass away? We, I don't know. Uh, we had medics there and we backed him out, but, um, I mean, he was, he was tore up pretty good. So yeah. thank God those girls didn't get hurt though. Man. Yeah. Uh, and I mean, that's, I can't believe the driver made it. Like that's the main thing you're, everybody should have been focusing on was his, you know, that cab of that truck and he made it too. Well, I remember the, um, uh, the Alpha Company first sergeant. We had to restrain him. He was ready. He was ready to kill somebody because he he was on the roadblock at the road uh, at the checkpoint. Mm. Dude, he came screaming down there, and it was like one of the biggest dudes in the company grabbed him and was just you know picking him up and turning him around, pushing him away because he was he was reaching for his forty five, and it's like you can't do that, man. <laughs> but, Jeez. <laughs> you know, so what? Um. You said something about Bill Dietz's admission. What's the, what's that story? Oh, so <laughs> we actually, so they were, um, they were trailing the tanks back into the to redeploy them. Mm -hmm. Um, 
so they had no comms that would reach from Kuwait City all the way back to Dammam. So we set up an HF network. Nice. So we had checkpoints to monitor the convoys and all that. So Bill and my Bill and that ALO stayed up where our last position was, and me. I forgot who it was. Me and somebody else. I think it was Sweda went down to Daman and set up there. And then we had a couple others, you know, the whole brigade was doing this mm-hmm. and you know, we get ready to get on the airplane to fly home. And, you know, at that time when you showed up there, there was like rows of dumpsters for amnesty boxes. And it's like, if you get caught with anything, you're staying here and you're going to be court martialed. So throw your crap away. Well, we're standing there getting ready to get on the airplane and Bill's like, Hey, uh, I got something I want to tell you. And I'm like, What's that? He goes, well, you know, one day we were on shift, you know, after we got off shift on the HF side, we went exploring, you know, there's dead tanks all over the place. And we went exploring and uh, we got up on this T-72, you know, I jumped off and I found this thing in the ground. I picked it up and he goes, I think it was a rock eye. He goes, but it didn't have any fins. And he goes, I kind of, you know, dug the sand out of it and blah, blah, blah. And he goes, I was walking off, you know, it was time to go. And I was walking off and I threw it over my shoulder and it exploded. (laughs) And dude, I lost it. I'm like, dude, we've been here for nine months. You know, we went through this whole thing and then you almost, I said, you know, and Bill was new. It was a new way. I'm like, what would I have told you? You know, it was just one of those moments. It's like, he felt like a kid waiting on his dad to get home, and I yeah, was just yeah. like, and, "That's like day know, one but, stuff." Like, you, like you see any UXO, you just leave it alone. You know, that's <laughs> just you know. But there, there was tech- rock eye. I mean, rock eye laying all over the place. Oh my I god! Mean, it looked like John Knipe had been over there dropping weapons again. You know, <laughs> I've heard guys tell that it's, it was just littered with, like you said, like blown up tanks and. Depleted uraniums everywhere and just, you know, just a mess. I remember our XO, and I've run into my the XO from the battalion a couple of times in industry. <laughs> you know, turret, you know, pulling up on a tank, it doesn't look like he's hit, dropping a thermite in, and as we're driving it off, the tank's just cooking off. Jeez. You know, it, it was really was the wild, wild west at some points of this. I mean... Yeah. It was very controlled. Don't get me wrong. The aggression was controlled. And that's one thing, you know, for us to be proud of is they did. We did what we had to do. Uh, but, you know, it was just it was there was too much time on hand at some points. Yeah. But you know? to your it was still a war. Like a lot of people kind of downplayed Desert Storm because it was only 100 hours. But it was still a war. You guys are still in harm's way. You were still fighting, you know, another a pretty formidable force. I mean, it was a war zone. And so, I mean, they're thing like we're, the way the professionalism of your unit and everybody else that went over there is, I think is commendable. You know what I mean? I think the, I think you guys went over there and did it right. Like, kind of like you said, it was controlled aggression and the other, you know, the Iraqis didn't know what hit them. Did you guys have any, um, uh, were, was in, were there any rumblings of like, let's keep on going? Uh, you know, you always hear about wanting to go down to Iraq and just kind of finish it there and. Yeah, so we were actually, so we went over as a roundout brigade for first calf. So Tiger Brigade's what we were called. We got chopped to second Marine Division. So second Marine Division went straight up. And I mean, literally when we showed up to second Marine Division, we gave them 66% more firepower. You know, they were still running around with M68 threes and stuff like that. But I mean, yeah, there was... Why did we stop? Why didn't we just continue on? Uh, you know, and that's, you know, much like going into Afghanistan. I mean, when I showed up over there, they were transitioning, you know, about three months in the deployment, we transitioned from a kinetic to a nation building war. Mm-hmm. You know, that's a political decision. We were just there to execute. Uh, you know, in my opinion, we probably started that a little bit early. Yeah. Um, you know, same thing there. You know, could we have changed the whole face of the Middle East if we had continued on? Yeah. Or would it have created another void in power? 